and I give you the praise. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen. 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 I'll tell you, I feel something this morning. All right. I really, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Keisha. There's my amen corner over here, but I need some more amen corners. Amen. That's okay. Amen. But uh, you're right, there's something. There's just a sweet spirit yeah. and an excitement. Amen. I'm excited about what God is doing and is going to do in this house. Amen. He goes before us. He makes the crooked ways straight. So my message titled to you today, it'll be a little mini-series, probably four, four weeks, maybe not. Any, I don't think it'll be any more. But we'll see how the Holy Ghost takes it. But the title is, Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled. How many of you know we need that message today? Amen. Let not... Your heart be troubled. Jesus told us this in John 14, 27. It says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. But today, we will turn to that scripture and possibly next week. But today, we are going to go over to Isaiah, the 43rd chapter. And we're going to read uh, two verses of scripture, one, verse 1 and 2, reading from the Amplified Version of the Bible. Isaiah 43, verse 1 and 2. But now, in spite of past judgments for Israel's sins, thus saith the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have ransomed you by paying a price instead of leaving you captive. I have called you by your name. You are mine. This is the verse I want to zero in on today, beloved. When you pass through, everyone say through. through. In other words, that means you're not going to get stuck in the middle. You're coming through whatever you're going through. When you pass through the waters, anyone ever been through the waters? When you thought life was going to drown you? Am I the only one? Okay. When you pass through the waters... I will be with you. And through the rivers, which are even deeper, I will be with you. They will not overwhelm you. Listen to this. When you walk through the fire, whew, anyone been through fire lately? <clears throat> I heard an amen from Brother Darrell over there. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned or scorched. Listen, nor will the flame kindle upon you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. I give this and I give ran ransom and I go on and on and on. But I, wanted, I, I wasn't going to plan to say this scripture, but I need to read it as God gave it to me right now. Verse 4. Why is God doing this? Why is God going to bring us through the water, bring us through the fire, bring us through all of this? Why? Verse 4 tells us, Because you are precious in my sight and honored, and because I love you, I will give men in return for you and peoples in exchange for your life. God spoke that scripture to me, and that's why my eye went right to it. Well over 30 years ago. And I've, I've, I can stand here, you know I'm an open book. Anyone that's ever been in this church for any amount of time know that I tell you the way it is and I tell you the truth and I hide nothing. I am an open book. And I can tell you before my God, when I read that scripture many, many years ago, I felt so unworthy until I found out who I was in Christ, who, what God had done for me. And when that was a, it was a rhema to me. You know the difference. Now, I've taught you this, but when you're reading the Bible, as our pastor Joe uh, encouraged everyone in the mornings to do, you know, you're really reading the logos of the word unless you dig deeper. But when it comes to be alive in your spirit, when you read it and it's alive, then it's the rhema of God's word and nothing can ever take that out of your heart. It's a promise from God. So many, many, many years ago when he spoke this to my heart, I didn't feel feel honored. I didn't feel uh, precious. I didn't feel these things. I was a young Christian. I was walking by my feelings, not by faith. And I had no idea what had happened to me at the new birth. All I know, knew was that it happened. 
That's all I knew. And the scripture says, God takes the foolish things to confound the wise, and that's my life. But I can honestly say over these years that I have tried with everything in my heart to honor God. I have tried. Now, have I, have I always made it? No. Have I missed the mark, which it means to sin? Have I missed the mark? Of course. I've, I've said and done things. I've been here. There. It, it doesn't matter. When you put it under the blood, it's finished. I thank God for my salvation every single day. And I'll say something to you, beloved. I take nothing for granted. Brother Joe, you know. You know what you've been through. You take nothing anymore for granted, do you? Nothing. Because we are not promised tomorrow. And when that moment comes, beloved, make sure you're ready. You know, I don't teach the end times because I'm not, I'm not uh, anointed by God to teach the end times. I stay in my lane of traffic. My lane of traffic is God's grace and Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible told me so. So I'm just simple and that's okay. But so when, when you're, when you're going, you know, into the end times and what have you, I've had people over the years come to me, well, do you believe in pre-trib? Do you believe in post-trib? I know. I mean, I know about the end times. My husband studied them. He loved the end times message. So I'm for it. I'm for all of those teachings. But I used to answer by this. You're asking me if I believe in pre-trib, post-trib. I'm going to tell you something. You better be ready for any trib. Whether it's post or pre, you better have your bags packed and know that the Bible's at the top of the case. Are you hearing me? So it says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, in the Message Bible, listen to this. I'm talking here this morning to you about let not your heart be troubled. I think we can all say one word that troubles us more than anything else in the times we're living in. Fear. And what is fear if you break it down? False evidence appearing real. Because most of the time, it's the enemy playing with your head. So here is the message Bible in uh, Matthew 6, verse 34. Don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up. Oh, I like that. In other words, it's all in his hands anyway. It's all in thee, Lord. It's all in thee. That's it. There's nothing you can do. I, I, I was saying to the Lord this morning, I can't put one hair on my head or make my, my stature one inch taller. It's all in God. And that's why we need to just rest. Get, enter. Well, you labor to enter into the rest according to Hebrews. Well, what does that mean, Pastor? It means know the Scriptures. Labor in your spirit. Labor to understand the word of God. And when you have the rhema of God's word, nothing and no one can take that out of your heart. And you'll enter into a rest with the things God has showed you. So what am I talking about today? I'm saying that God is still in control. He's not been knocked off the throne any time soon. I mean, he's still up there. He's still God. He's still the creator of this universe. He knew you before he, he had you in your mother's womb. And he knows the moment you breathe, breathe, breathe your first breath. And he knows when you'll gasp your last one. There's nothing God doesn't know. There's no one in this earth he doesn't know. It's amazing to us we can't comprehend it. But it's true. So fear is just a grown up version of worry. Now listen. If you let one in... The other comes with it. Stop and take inventory of the things you worried about, beloved. And I've done this. I'm teaching this to me today. Stop and take inventory of the things that you worried about last year or even last month. How many of them came to pass? And how many did you change by worrying? How much did you change by worrying, nothing. You've heard me say it many times, but worry's like a rocking chair. You get plenty of exercise, but you don't get nowhere. So you can't change anything for the better or for worse. And what about the physical and emotional toll that all that worry took on you? 
Have you ever been there, beloved? I have. Laid at night for hours. But I've discovered something in the years I've served the Lord. There's nothing that I can do to change anything. I'll do the very best I can to pastor this church. I'll do the very best I can. New programs, this, that, the next thing. I want, I want so much, so much uh, to see, uh, you know, the, the youth uh, grow up in the Lord. I want so much to see all of that. And while I'm on that subject, we are going to be building this gymnasium. It's coming, but it's going to be in God's time. It's coming. You see, you don't want to go ahead of God and arrive there before he gets there. It's dangerous. Very dangerous. And so I'm simply saying to you today, I am believing God for great, great things. I'm not going to be worrying about what's going to happen, what's not going to happen. The physical and emotional toll is not going to be on me anymore. Do you hear what I'm trying to say? So what does your worrying say to those around you who know that you're a Christian? And when are we going to face up to the fact that we all worry too much and do something about it? Pastor Joe said it when he came up here for a few moments. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to open the Bibles in the morning? Are we going to do things for God? Are we going to walk out our faith? We do, you're right. We, we get into a place of uh, complacency, brother. Amen. I would, you know, I know you said laziness, and that's part of it, but complacency. Complacency. You'll only start worrying about tomorrow, beloved, when you learn to trust the one who holds tomorrow. David said it this way, Commit thy way unto the Lord. That's the key. That's the key. Commit everything to the Lord. Give it to him. You've got to stop wasting today's grace on tomorrow's concerns. It's amazing how much more you will accomplish, you and I will accomplish, when we learn to live one day at a time. Matthew 6.34 The truth is, when you go through a crisis, now listen carefully because this is a a nugget for some of you. The truth is, when you go through a crisis, you discover things about God that you never knew before. I know I can say a resounding amen to that one. I have discovered over the years that he surely is a brother that sti- a, a, a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I have discovered that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he will change not. I have discovered that he will never leave me nor forsake me. Everybody can jump ship, but Jesus will be laying in the back of my ship sound asleep. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sound asleep. So the truth is, when you go through these things, we used to say, and it's, it's really is partly true, it's true. You know, what won't kill you will strengthen you. And you're strengthened through the things that happen to you when you have to trust God. You're strengthened in your faith. Hallelujah. So here's an idea. Instead of worrying, begin to attack your anxieties with the promises of God. I mean, attack your anxieties. Tell the enemy, enough, enough already. This is what the word says. This is what I'm going to stand on. This is what I'm going to believe, devil. Get out of my face. You say, you talk that way, you better believe it. You better believe it, I do. Hallelujah. So attack, counterattack, let's put it that way, with the promises of God. Bring your fears, beloved into the presence of God and watch them die. Because fear and anxiety and worries and troubled hearts cannot stay in the presence of God. You cannot worship God and be in fear at the same time. It's not possible. Because he is the Prince of Peace. And he says to you every day of your life, peace, be still. And know that I am God. You can't just think it, beloved. You need to know it. You need to know it. It's wonderful what will happen to you when Christ 
replaces worry at the center of your life. Just think about it for a few moments. Think about it for a few minutes. When you're in, you know, when you're in prayer or just talking to the Lord, might be in your vehicle going to work, how much better you feel. Even if you've got a, a CD playing or whatever with, with worship music or a teaching, because the Word is what's building you up, as I was teaching last week. That's your strength is from within. That's where your strength comes from. <laughs> there was a man in the Bible that knew this. His name was Caleb. At 85 years old, Caleb could say, my life changed in an instant for the good, thank God, when God gave me the mountain that he promised me. Let me say this to you. What has the Lord promised you? What has the Lord promised you? Beloved, don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. Your life can change in an instant. We read in Numbers 14, 24, the NIV version of the Bible says this, my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. Not in and out, up and down, hot and cold, good this week, bad next week, Oh, and you know. No, he followed him wholeheartedly. There was no excuse in Caleb's life, not his age, nothing. He had been believing God for a long time. If he were alive today, Caleb would be nominated man of the year. Listen to his story in his own words. I am 40 years old, or I was rather 40 years old, when Moses sent me to explore the land. I brought him back a report according to my convictions, or you could say according to the belief I had in my God. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. And that's the, plot, the plan and the plot of the enemy today, to melt your hearts with fear. Yeah. However, Caleb said, I followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. He could say that. You might say, well, isn't that kind of proud? No, he was proud of it, yes, and he should have been. He should have been. He saw what words did to the people of God. He saw it with his own eyes. He came back with a good report. The rest of the spies came back and said, oh, there's giants in that land. You should see the size of these grapes. Oh, we don't have a snowball's chance in hell, was what they were saying. But Caleb had a different spirit. And he goes on to say, that day Moses swore to me, so if he was saying, if Moses swore to me, then God told Moses that this was going to happen. That's what under shepherds are. So here we see, that day Moses swore to me, the land in which your feet has walked will be your inheritance. Now remember, he was 40 years old at the time. He didn't get that inheritance till he was 85. I've said that often to the Lord. I've had many promises in my life when I was 33 years old. Amen. Now that I'm the new 60, <laughs> but I said, Lord, I don't want to wait another 10 years. 85, no, I don't think so. I'm going to see things long before that. So he says, and here I am today, 85 years old. Here, he said it. He says, the land you, that I've given you, you will walk in it. And here I am, the voice of Caleb in the 21st century. Here I am, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today. Listen to this. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I read that and I'm encouraged. Are you hearing me today? I don't care how young you are or how old you are. These are powerful scriptures. And he, Caleb goes on to say, I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now at 85 than when I was then. Now give me the hill country or give me the mountain that the Lord promised me. I want it now. I'm not waiting any longer. And then Joshua blessed Caleb and gave him Hebron as 
his inheritance because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Don't you ever, ever, ever give up on a promise God has gave you. That's the plan and the plot of the devil. He has great things planned for your life. And I want to see each and every one of you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. That's my position in the body of Christ to pastor this flock to the best way I can. If things don't always go right, I turn them over to God and ask him to help me. That's right. Are you hearing me? Because I'll never find, I'll, you'll never find, and nor will I ever find the perfect place to worship because the moment we walk in, it becomes imperfect. Caleb's life can be summed up in four sentences. One, he had a different spirit from those around him. Two, he believed that God through that he believed that through God it could be done, even when others said it couldn't. That's a key. You'll always have the naysayers. Always have the naysayers. Oh, Pastor Pat. Oh, do you think? Please leave me alone. I try to be polite. Don't ever take my hope. I'll never take an individual's hope. Don't take mine. Because hope deferred makes the heart sick. So here we see, one, he had a different spirit. Two, he believed that through God it could be done, even when others said it wouldn't. Three, he had a dream that neither time nor circumstance could diminish. Boy, when I was looking at my notes this morning, that went right into my spirit. Because I just, I said to the Lord, Lord, when? When is it going to happen? The things you've told me, when are they going to happen? And I'll tell you, I had a peace just come all over me because I have a dream. And that dream is not about circumstances or time. It's about God's purpose and God's plan. And let me say something to you, beloved. With or without me at this pulpit, with or without me as the, the, the leader of this church at this time, it doesn't matter. What God spoke over this house will happen, either under my leadership or someone else's. But you will see, if I don't, you will see a thousand strong. Amen. It was given to me many years ago, and the Lord spoke to me clearly and said, that's men alone. Not counting the women and the children. Now, if I have to look naturally, really seriously, but I'm not looking naturally. I don't know what I'll see of it. Because when he called this house, he put that vision in me. But it's my responsibility now to put that vision into others and see them grow in the Lord. And who knows? Who knows what generation will see what I just said to you? But I hope you'll remember it. Because God's not a man that he can lie. God will bring it to pass in his time. So number three, he had a dream. Caleb said, no, I'm not looking at circumstances. No, I I don't, I'm not looking at time here. That's obvious. It was 45 years later before he had Hebron. 45 years. And four, even in old age, he remained young at heart. Oh, I love that. He remained young at heart. Have you ever heard that old song? I know, I'm the singing preacher, and some of you, it bothers, but the rest of you enjoy it. (laughs) Fairy tales can come true. They can happen to you if you're young at heart. But there's one verse I love in there. It's the very end. I can't sing the rest or I would. (laughs) I don't remember it, but it says... And if you should survive to 105, think of all you've derived out of being alive. And here is the best part. You have a head start if you are among the very young at heart. Give yourself a big hug. (laughs) So even in old age, he remained young at heart. But here's the key. He remained totally committed to God. Ask God today, beloved. Ask God to help you today to get that kind of commitment inside of you. 
for to commit to, to ministering to people that, as God opens the door. Commit to getting involved in your, your home church. Commit to, to being a part of a body. Commit to Christ. Commit to be everything God wants you to be, and you'll never regret it. So here in Isaiah 43, 1, it simply says this, Fear not, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have redeemed you. Everywhere we look today, beloved, we see people are running scared. That's the only way you can put it. They're scared about the falling economy. They're scared about their finances. They're scared about the jobs. They're scared about the future. Have you ever felt fear welling up inside of you as you turn on the news and you hear report after report of depressing information? Need I say any more about what we heard this week? If that doesn't strike fear in your heart, of course it does. Of course it does. So, Pastor, what do we do in situations like that? We pray. We pray. Because you see, the secret things, beloved, will always belong to God. We don't have the answers. I don't, there's not a pastor or a, a leader in the body of Christ that can give you the answers to these things. We know that we live in a world that's, that's fallen. It's a fallen world. We know we live with evil. We're not, talk, we're not even talking about flesh and blood in these things. We're talking about principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this earth. We're talking about demon-possessed people. We can call them anything you want. But the truth is the truth. Yes, there's mental situations and all the rest of it, but it's sad. We're called to pray. We're called to believe. We're called to, to speak forth what we believe into this atmosphere. And we're called to bless and not curse. So... What does God have to say about it all? But now thus saith the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, who has formed you, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. What else does he say? When you pass through, through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will be not scorched, and nor will that flame burn against you. Since you are, notice it's past tense, since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored and I love you. Notice many times we have to go through the situations. And at the end of the day, beloved, for any Christian, at the end of the end of the day, Nothing in this world will matter anyway. We will be with him throughout eternity. God tells you and he tells me not to fear. And he gives us solid reasons why we don't have to. First reason, he has redeemed you. He has bought us back. That is what redeemed literally means. It means to buy back. Buy back from what? Buy back from the control of the enemy. The enemy has no control over you, only the power of suggestion that he will put in your mind and allow you to speak forth and create life for that bad suggestion. 2,000 years ago, Jesus brought us back. Jesus died on that cross. We're coming in to the, the, the resurrection season in our lives. Every day, of course, should be resurrection, but you know what I'm saying. But over 2,000 years ago, he died for us. He purchased us. Now the transaction does not become complete until you give your life to him, but it's finished. It was finished 2,000 years ago. It was finished. The curse was finished. Jesus became a curse for us. The curse in this world, the curse of, of, of everything we see around us should not affect the body of Christ. And when it does affect the body of Christ, there is an answer. And only between you and your God, you'll find it. Because he has given us every way of escape through his word. So we see that 
he, you, he will give us life, but when, when we do miss it, rest assured that we are his. He's not leaving us. He's not forsaken us. He's not saying, oh yeah, you messed it up today. Get out of my face. No, that's not the Lord. Thank God. And God will take care of those who are his. Let not your heart be troubled. The second reason to not fear is he is with you. The moment you give your life to Jesus, he comes to live inside of you by his spirit. We can't even comprehend that. The great God of the universe, the God who spoke creation into existence, lives inside of everyone who has truly given his or her life to him. How can we fathom the depths? We can't. The Bible tells us we can't even touch the surface of God's love for us. And I truly believe in God's love for me, but I know I haven't even touched it. Not the depth, not the depth. How could he love us so much and still see, let's be honest, the mess we make of things. Because if we were the parent talking to our children, I don't think we'd be saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. You would be saying, get over my knee. Oh, of course, that's child abuse today, sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. So can we comprehend this? That the great God of this universe is within us. What possibly, what could we, you and I, fear when Jesus is with us? The reason we fear is because we don't have the revelation that he's with us. Right. I think it's way up there somewhere, yes? He's seated at the right hand of the Father, but what is he doing? He's making intercession for us. He's ne we're never out of his thoughts. The Bible tells us that God has us in his thoughts every second. He loves us. Notice that Isaiah 43, 2 says, when, not if, when you come through. When speaks of rivers and waters and fires and troubles. When. Those difficulties, beloved, whether we want to face life or not, it's a reality. That's all I can say. Every one of us will face them. But a Christian never faces them alone. Can you say this with me? I will never face my difficulties alone. Now turn to that person beside you and say, and that goes for you too. Hallelujah. He is with us. Our creator who can speak worlds into existence is with you and I. Listen, Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. Yet God was in there with him, and Daniel suffered no harm. Yet when the evil men who manipulated the king to throw Daniel to the lions were thrown in, when they went in, they were consumed before they even hit the ground. When God is with us, we face problems with his strength and his protection. How great is that? Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. The third reason to not fear, and for me, this is probably the most important one, because I'm working in this revelation, but I'm getting it more and more every day of my life. The third reason to not fear is he loves you. He loves you. Amen. When somebody truly, truly loves you, and you know that you love them, you can trust them with your life. You've seen that in this horrible situation last week when the coach stood in front of those kids and let them take his life for them. That's true love. You can't deny it. None of us can deny it. So the lions, they, were, they, were not, they, they didn't have the power over Daniel. All the lions in your life, you not, might not be hearing this lion roar coming in that door, but you know what it sounds like in your life. Amen. That lion does have no power over you, none. So the third reason he loves you, God makes it clear that we are precious to him. He loves us and he says, no matter, 
no matter what happens, we matter to him. Your life matters to him. Anyone who loves you enough to die for you is worthy of all of your trust. God's not going to leave you in the midst of your storms. No way. And because he loves you, you can be assured that he will never drop you in the fire. He will be faithful to bring you through and bring you home safe and sound. Where does this leave us? Our part in this covenant is to believe. Let me read again to you what God told us to do when things get tough. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. Let not your heart be troubled. Many times, we never find out that place of rest in our God because of fear. And David continually reminded himself that God was with him. Psalm 27, 1. With God on my side, I'm fearless. I'm afraid of no one or nothing. In other words, he was afraid of no one or no thing. Because God was on his side. Failure in the past, beloved, can lead to fear in your future. Listen carefully. Too many of us get stuck in the cycle of fear because we're afraid to deal with the problem. We don't gain experience, so we can't handle it the next time. This is good stuff if you're listening. Take notes. We remain stuck in this cycle, and the longer we stay there, the harder it is to break out. God wants to give good things to you. But he can't move you forward if you're still t stuck in your past. It doesn't work that way. You say, well, how do I break out of the cycle of fear past? I'm telling you, the answer is feel the fear and do it anyway. Feel the fear and do it anyway. I, I, I'll never forget. I'll never forget one, one experience I had in an airplane with a young woman. She's from this area, well, quite a ways away. I will never forget it as long as I live. Because I, as soon as we, you know, the pilot said, whatever, fasten your seatbelts, whatever, we're taking off. This young woman, that was her husband and her were going on their honeymoon. And uh, she had been, I think she had been in a plane once, but this was her second time, I believe, if my memory serves me correctly. And as soon as this, I didn't know her from Adam. I'm sitting beside her. She was in the middle and her husband was at the, was at the window. And she grabbed my hand. She didn't know me from Adam. She, I'm telling you, that little girl's knuckles were pure white. And she was shaking like this. And I'll never forget it. I said, dear, calm down. Calm down. Oh, I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid. I knew this was going to happen. See, I knew this was going to happen. Okay, and I'm just sitting there listening. I'm letting her talk, which I'm not always that good at, letting people finish what they're saying. Okay. And I'm sorry for that, Lord. But anyway, I, I mean, I'm sorry that I don't always let other people finish. I guess it's just part of me. I'm learning. So she's holding my hand, and her knuckles are white, shaking like a leaf. And I said, dear... You're okay. You're okay. I thought I would be, but I said, no, no, no. I want, I'm going to talk to you. And she, and she looked at me. She says, who are you? Are you an angel? I said, not quite. <laughs> she, because she could sense the Holy Spirit. See, they don't know. They could just sense it. You know, you walk into a room and a child will come up to you and start talking to you. That's the Lord. A child knows no fear around Jesus. And so I said to her, I said, no, I'm not an angel, but I'm a pastor. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. She's going on and on. I said, honey, I'm going to just try to teach you a few things in the next five minutes, okay? She says, okay. I said, I want you to face your fear. This will be the last time you'll ever have to do this. Just face your fear and do it anyway. How do I do that, pastor? I said, you do it by speaking it forth. And I tried to put an hour and a half sermon into five minutes. It's not easy. 
But I said, and, and, and she followed me in this little confession. Her husband was sitting there smiling because now she's not shaking. Now she's loosening her grasp on me. What was happening? The word was causing her not to fear. Peace. That's where Jesus is. His ways are peace and pleasantness. And if decisions you're making or have made or, yes. or want to make in the future, do not come with peace and pleasantness. Take some advice from one that knows. Do not do it. So, after that, we just started to talk and we started to talk. And before that plane journey was over, she was laughing, smiling. Of course, I gave her something to laugh about once she got to know me. I told her, I said, I could tell you, I could have told you before you sat down, you were going nowhere. She said, well, what do you mean? Because I said, I'm on this flight and I'm getting to the other side. <laughs> and she laughed. You got to keep a sense of humor here. Is it okay to laugh? Yeah. Well, when she got off that plane, her and her husband were hugging us, hugging me rather. And I said, never forget what I told you, my dear. Face your fears. Face them and do it anyway. And once you do it again and again and again, it gets easier and easier and easier. Hallelujah. Okay. So you may say to me, well, pastor, where do I get the strength? God, David tells us, with God on my side, side I am fearless. Maybe God's on my sight too. I just thought about that. All your websites. God's there too. Amen. As well as we're side. So are we convinced, really convinced, that God is on our side today? I'm wrapping this up in a few moments. Or are you waiting for motivation? Let me say something to you, beloved. If you're waiting to be motivated, motivation isn't going to strike you like lightning. Forget it. It's not going to happen. Now, this is from a medical journey, journal, rather. It says, motivation isn't going to strike like lightning if it's not something that others can bestow or force on you. The whole idea of motivation is a trap. Listen, forget motivation, just do it. Exercise, lose weight, test your blood sugar, and whatever else you start doing, doing is the, the motivation will come yes. and you'll find a place of peace you never knew. A Harvard, a Harvard psychologist says it this way. I love this. This is really eye-opening. You are more likely to act yourself into feeling than feel yourself into acting. So act. Every morning, beloved, in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the fastest lion or it will be killed. Every morning in Africa, a lion wakes up. It knows it must outrun run the slowest gazelle or it will starve to death. Point, listen. It doesn't matter whether you're a lion or a gazelle. When the sun comes up, you better be running. Just that simple. And if you walk by feelings, you will never walk by faith. And as the title of my, my message says today, let not your heart be troubled. And I'm going to close now with a little joke. It's called the pastor's heart. And I believe you'll be really, at least I, I laugh my head off with this one. So maybe I'm just easily amused. I don't know. This particular story is called The Pastor's Cat. This particular story just made me laugh. Every time I think about it, the vision of that poor cat amuses me. Whoever said the creator does not have a sense of humor? Dwight Nelson recently told a true story about the pastor of his church. He had a kitten that climbed up a tree in his backyard and then was afraid to come down. The pastor coaxed him, offered him warm milk, gave everything he could. The kitty would not come down. The tree was not sturdy enough to climb. So the pastor decided that if he tied a rope to his car and drove away so that the tree bent down, he could then reach up and get the kitten. Well, he did. 
all the while checking his progress in the car frequently. He then figured if he went just a little bit further, the tree would bend sufficiently for him to reach the kitten. But as he moved a little further towards, towards it, the rope broke. The tree went bong, and the kitten instantly sailed through the air out of sight. The pastor felt terrible. He walked all over the neighborhood asking people if they'd seen a little, little kitten. No, nobody had seen a stray kitten, so he prayed, Lord, I just commit this kitten to your keeping and went on about the business. A few days later, he was at a grocery store and met one of his church members that lived behind him. He happened to look into a shopping cart and was amazed to see cat food. This woman was a cat hater, and everyone knew it. So he asked her, why are you buying cat food when you hate cats so much? She replied, you won't believe this. <laughs> and to told him how her little girl had been begging her for a cat, but she kept refusing. Then a few days before, the child had begged her again. So the mom finally told her little girl, okay, fine. If God gives you a cat, I'll let you keep it. <laughs> and she told the pastor, she said, the gospel truth pastor, I watched my child go out into the yard, get on her knees and ask God for a cat. And really, pastor, I know you won't believe this, but I saw it with my own eyes. A kitten flying out of the blue sky <laughs> with its paws outspread landed right in front of her. The moral of the story, never underestimate the power of God and his unique sense of humor, because every time you wake up, God laughs. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Music ministry, come up, please. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Aren't our music ministry great? God, give them a big hand. Are you still laughing, Chris? <laughs> With every head bowed and every, every heart before God this morning. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, but this is your day, I just want to encourage you today, make the best of it. This is your day to give your life to Christ, or perhaps you're here today and you haven't been serving the Lord the way you know you should, and you'd like to rededicate your life to the Lord. I want to pray with you. I'm not asking you to come forward. No, no, just where you are. God sees your hearts. And I'll lead you in a final prayer before we dismiss today. If there's anyone anywhere would say, I need to know Jesus, Pastor. Would I, could I see your hand? I only ask you to put it up and back down again. Is there anyone there, Pastor Sandy? Right over there? Okay, God bless you. Put it back down again. Anyone else? I think there was another one there. Back down again. Thank you. God bless you. Okay, we believe that these people are, have got sincere hearts before God. And as Christians, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. Today, I confess my sin. And I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart. Now, I know as Christians, he's already in your heart. You're just praying this along with whoever is not. And today, Lord Jesus, I make you my Lord. I give you the praise for my new birth. And I want to tell you that I love you. It's just that simple. And if you said that prayer from your heart, beloved, you're born again. Please see Pastor Sandy or anyone else back there. Give you some literature and get you well on your way.